Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see a, a great turnout. Uh, I am Anna Mingal with the professor with the ISBA department. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, AI and digital transformation. So both the business side as well as the technology side. Uh, but I'm going to start out with inviting our associate dean, Larry Kalbers, to welcome you all. Hello. Good. You ready for some AI? Yeah. Yeah. So believe it or not, I, even though I'm a, an associate dean and professor of accounting, I, I really am interested in this AI stuff because I'm interested in ethics. And I think there's so many aspects of AI and ethics. Uh, and I've been, been talking with some of the panelists, well, all of the panelists about this issue. So I'm really excited to learn a lot tonight as well. Because uh, you know AI is going to be in more and more and more places, and so there are biases that may be built in, biases that may not be known, and so I'm really excited to hear about some of the work that they're doing and, and their thoughts, and they're from very different kinds of organizations as well, and so it's going to be very exciting to hear about this. So I'm looking forward to it. So uh, thanks for coming to me. And then next, I'm going to invite our chair of the ISBA department, Information Systems Business Analytics, Kalasi. Good evening, everybody. Once again, you know, you should have realized that when I'm wearing this jacket that I'm going to come here and say something, right? Yeah. Um, I, I am the information, I'm chair of the Information Systems and Business Analytics, and I've been in this space for quite some time. You know, I actually started, it was in the birth of the MIS, you can say, you know, in late 80s, and then seen all of this transformation. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing really the importance of the artificial intelligence, because the real one is definitely living. You know, <laughs> yeah. so I think pretty soon we'll need artificial intelligence. But kidding aside, um, I think, you know, the, 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 you have seen the transformation of the world. And that, you know, we used to say that it's always going to come from the academic side. And that's happened for a long time with the research and other things. But with the technology and the applications of the technology, what is happening is that all of these people who are here, they are heading that transformation that's changing our lives, or it has already changed our lives. And we have started taking things for granted. You know, if I tell you, oh, there was a DVD player, you're going to look at me going, what? What is that? Or in a or a video cassette, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen that because you are so used to streaming, right? So all of these transformations that are happening, and then there is an AI or the artificial intelligence that's coming behind it to make our life easier. But at the same time, I think to make it a lot more complicated, as Larry said, in the unintended consequence of the technology. Um, what is the role of the academics out here? I just quickly you know, want to mention that. You know, so everything is happening mainly in the practical space, right? You know, all of the innovations, all of the new things and everything. And we as academics, we are real, we're trying to catch up. But at the same time, I think uh, there is something that we can provide from the academic side. And that's what Larry said, that a different perspective, because people who are in the trenches, they're so busy doing it that sometimes, you know, taking that 30,000 feet, you know, overview, you might lose that. And as a result, some of the unintended consequences, I mean, think of social media, it started for something good. And now what, you know, suddenly there is bullying that's happening. You know, there is all of these different kind of, you know, lack of interaction, the social, societal fabric kind of breaking down in some places. Who thought of that? Similarly with the artificial intelligence, if you are not careful, then if you start accepting some of the things as a default, pretty soon, you know, it will start governing us as opposed to us governing them. Mm -hmm. So we have programs, we have curriculums, you know, we are trying to catch up and create something. We have like masters in business analytics, which kind of talks a little bit about that, our area transformed over the years and doing something. Uh, but I'm very, very excited to actually hear what, you know, what is happening in, in, in the industry and learn from there. And uh, thank you all for coming and looking forward to it. Thank you. A little bit of why we are here and how we got here. So uh, Todd, uh, who is right here? He's the founder of AILA. Uh, I met him. When did you found AILA? Ten years? 
2016. Five, five, six years ago. I remember it was a big event at Google uh, that you launched AI LA And he's so entrenched in Silicon Beach. And we were talking about how can we do collab collaboration. And so uh, this is one of the ways in which we are collaborating together with AI LA. I'm going to ask Todd to say hello. Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Yeah, Taj Baraz. Uh, so I founded this back of, uh, in April of 2016. It was just a casual meetup group talking about chatbots. And that was back in the time when I was running a for profit company uh, focusing on building chatbots, originally trying to build an AI 911 operator with the IBM Watson platform, and then le leading into less mission critical type applications of chatbots for customer service and marketing uh, for the live entertainment space. And so that's kind of where I got my. My got into this whole AI world, and then when I uh, decided uh, to turn um, basically that meetup group into a nonprofit, I decided to turn it into AI LA, rebrand to AI LA instead of the LA Chatbot Meetup Group, and then we started doing meeting events to kind of get started. And the pandemic kind of really kind of like destroyed most of that, right? Like, like <laughs> a lot of things that most of us are probably building those days. Uh, but it was really nice that the pandemic really gave us a time to like take a breath and really kind of refocus and recalibrate. And so this year we came back stronger than ever. Uh, where now we open up with two new different programs. So instead of just being a community development kind of organization through meeting events, convenings, uh, now we have two different programs. One that we piloted earlier this year, that's a workforce development program that we're, we're now in early developments of, where we're going to be focusing on AI literacy programs across community colleges here in LA County. Um, and the second program is focusing on open innovation challenges. So working with local government, local NGO, or NGOs in general, and corporations to help fund and facilitate blue sky thinking. So right now, actually, we're working on a project. Right now, there's uh, about 10 teams competing for uh, two different challenges. One's with the All of Us Research Program, which is an NIH-backed program, focusing on developing more diverse data sets within the healthcare industry. And the second one is with this other organization called RTI Rarity, where there's teams developing predictive models uh, for underdiagnosed uh, diseases here in the California. And so it's very interesting. This is just our first year kind of highlighting this you know, workforce development and innovation like extended hackathons for your for you to really understand what we're doing um and we want to really want to scale this right so that's uh, across all of los angeles and so Absolutely. this is really an amazing panel discussion to really kind of dip your toes into what's really happening and how things are impacting different industries ac across uh, all the different industries uh for aila we mostly focus on climate uh, and sustainability and healthcare and life sciences because just there's only so much you can do you know and i'm the only full-time person right now and so I feel like why don't we use the AI for good? We can always talk about AI and art, generative AI, art, you know, text to image, probably who here has ever used like mid-journey or stable diffusion or nope, maybe two, Absolutely. all right, three. I see great. Um, anyways, um, I'm trying to stall a little bit because our moderator is trying to talk <laughs> hard. Um, <laughs> I, I get all right, cool. Do, but, um, can you talk about the final, uh, the the so, um, because they've seen that in their Oh, really? Nice. All right. So, we're um, starting a new little project that we hope to have ready by October 20th uh, for our live summit. What we're doing is we've already wrangled all these data sets from each district of LA County. So, if you didn't know, LA district is divided up. <laughs> LA <laughs> district is uh, divided up into five different districts. Uh, LA County starts, is divided up into five different districts. Each district uh, has open data sets about everything you can think of. So we wrangle data from each district that tells a compelling story about climate change and health disparities that plague each district. Uh, the first project we did was developing that into generative AI artwork, which was displayed on a huge rooftop in downtown LA during LA Tech Week at our Fun for Funds Festival. And that was pretty amazing. We worked with this artist from Turkey named Ouch, and he built these beautiful displays based off really ugly data. Um, and so it was very interesting. Um, and the second uh, variation of this project is taking the same data sets and developing these five different kiosks where we'll be using Tableau to basically develop these overlays of different data pipelines so that people, constituents of each district, can learn more about their neighborhood and what's like lack of tree canopy or um, uh, what's called, uh, yeah, lack of tree canopy or a number of different little challenges. Um, so we are looking for volunteers who have experience working with Tableau to uh, work on that project. Yeah. And you, you, well, those of you who are students here, you must have got it in your inboxes. So if you're interested, form teams and let us know and you can participate in it. Yeah. yeah. 
And that's just one of many projects we're working on. We have a, another open source project called FishEye, focusing on developing a data lake of all this publicly accessed uh, same, uh, climate data from like the EPA and whatnot and NOAA. Um, and so, yeah, if you're into sustainability and climate change, hit me up afterwards, love the chat. Great, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a couple more things uh, uh, is uh, that uh, you may be ILA. This is also a partnership with ISV Society. And John is here. Would you just say hi to everybody? He's the president of ISV Society. <laughs> And uh, Rebecca is also here from there. And then a few of our colleagues are here. So I just want them to say hello. Would you mind saying hello, Robbie and Mustafa and Sam, Greg? Uh, I'm Robbie Nakasi. I'm a professor here. I'm going to people's in both the electives and the other epi Thank you. Hello, everyone, Mustafa. Yeah, in three years, yeah. I teach you team and it's quite helpful. And I'm very happy to see you all this again. And I'm looking forward to all our conversations. Thank you. I am Sam Kaji, relatively new. I think this is uh, third year. Um, teaching, uh, basically, you know, uh, Business information technology uh, for the kids and for the final year students for the system analysis and design, and I'm also the mentor for the casting projects. And uh, very much interested in uh, everything that's in the language. Okay. Okay. I'm Greg, I'm not a student, but I was a student at MBO. I teach SQL in computer for four years, teach operations, networking, cloud computing, and great computer. Okay, all right. So what Todd was trying to tell us was that we're waiting for a moderator. Believe it or not, we are so many of us that the drawing the parking is full. Wow. And so Lara, with that you made it early. So Lara is going from parking lot to parking lot to find out, you know, where there's a parking. Uh, spot. Uh, but what we can do is I'm going to introduce her and then we can go into the talks. Um, and uh, by the time Lara gets here, then we can start the conversation. All right. Okay. So just introducing uh, Lara, who is going to be the moderator. She, she also helped uh, bring everybody together. So she is a strategic investor and advisor with over 18 years experience in institutional investment management and venture capital advisory. She is CEO and founder of Beyond Ventures, mm -hmm. an investment and innovation advisory firm, partnering with entrepreneurs, investors, researchers, and artists to advance innovation in longevity, care, and consumer wellness. She's currently the interim caregiving strategy lead at Pivotal Ventures, the incubation and investment company founded by Melinda French Gates. She's also an active angel investment investor and on the board of directors for AILA. Previously, this is the most interesting part I, I, I feel, right? Uh, she designed and led the XR Education Prize Challenge and innovation competition funded by the Gates Foundation. To immerse, uh, to immersive education applications, and served as an investment officer managing a 1.5 billion venture capital and growth equity fund portfolio at Utimpo, the investment firm overseeing 35 billion of University of Texas system endowment assets. So, as you can tell, she has a really interesting background, and uh, she's she's worked in nonprofit and also in an investment. And so when she gets here, she'll take it over. In the meantime, we can start with our uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, I will have her introduce you when she gets here, but we can start with her. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. We can, can yeah. also introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be great. Um, so I can say, I can say that. So I, look, like, I have slides. I don't have to go through all of them. Um, the, there. Um, well, hi everybody. I'm Alana Goldman. I'm a director of PwC. I'm part of a team called PwC Labs. We are an applied research arm for PwC, which means that I have a really fun job. I get to think about how we can use and test how we use emerging technologies to solve some of our clients' pressing problems. 
Um, and specifically, I'm one of the leads for artificial intelligence within that group. And as part of that role, I also lead PwC's efforts in response for AI global, and I've been doing that for eight years. Um, I consider myself an old hat, as it seems, with AI, even though I'm part of this wave of AI adoption, because I started my data science career just around when TensorFlow was released. So I've been, I've seen like every phase of this current generation of, of AI. It's been really, really exciting to see it, it really come to fruition. And that's also how um, I came to meet Todd, actually, incidentally, at a conference in Geneva, Switzerland, which is pretty fun. Um, so I have a few different things I can talk about, but before I get started, just show of hands, who here um, knows what AI is? Okay, does someone want to explain that to me? Yeah. Okay, it would be a general term that just tells that the program can mimic some type of function that our real intelligence would do, and not necessarily specify that it's some kind of deep learning thing. Mm -hmm. That, that's really, really good. Normally I get robots. So <laughs> I'm super impressed. Like round of applause uh, for all of you guys. Um, AI is a, a very old term. It's been around for many years. You guys have probably heard this a million times, but it's it's been around since the 50s and it is really just indicates a class of techniques that are used to create really complex computer interactions. I don't like the phrase to mimic human intelligence, if I'm being completely honest, because it's really just doing cool stuff that sometimes requires things that people want to do. Um, now, why is this kind of important? I, I'll, I'll, there, there have been many different iterations of machine learning and, and AI over the years. Um, right now, there's really interesting Twitter debate between Jan LeCun and a few other researchers around what AI is and what's going to achieve artificial general intelligence. You guys are active on Twitter, it's where some of the AI researchers still are. We haven't quite made it to TikTok yet, but we will get there eventually. Uh, just give us time. We're slow on the uptake. The, the uh, basic distinction between that I like to say between the modern day machine learning and traditional computing is that we are, rather than defining a series of rules in a system, we're actually allowing a system, a system to infer those series of rules on our behalf. That's not always true. There are varieties of those of systems like reinforcement learning and other types of simulation intelligence or um, causal machine learning that follow some different principles, but at its core, we're just allowing a computer to create complex rules on our behalf. Um, so I think that's a really important distinction to make because in my role around um, thinking about the risks of machine learning, I hear like risks of unintended consequences and I like pop out of some kind of woodwork over here. It's my, <laughs> my favorite thing to talk about it because I think it's really important. It's important for us to remember that these technologies are based on historical representations of reality. Meaning that if we don't agree with what history has indicated, our models are going to fail us. And that is a really, really important thing for us to think about when people are offering solutions that say that they're going to solve all sorts of problems, they're going to fix everything that's wrong with reality, they're going to eliminate biases. That is factually incorrect. And we need to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly careful about what type of um, intelligence we impart on these systems. They're actually pretty dumb, even though they can create really pretty images and can do some really complex stuff. They are not actual intelligence. I think that's really important to state. Um, there, there has been a huge uptick of how AI has been used across organizations. I would venture to say every single company has now incorporated some type of artificial intelligence into their environment, whether or not they know it. That's a completely different problem. Um, it usually comes in through either capabilities they're building in-house if they have those teams, but usually it's through vendor solutions and other types of products and services that they're buying. Um, and the reason why I'm stipulating that is important is because companies do not often have the capabilities to know what technology they have in-house. And so when you're then asking them to govern those systems, they can't do it effectively. They don't even know what they have. Um, the attorney general of the state of California a few weeks ago issued a, a letter to hospital systems requiring that they produce a list of all artificial intelligence systems that might potentially impact patients and have a bias. I would again venture to say not a single hospital can comply with that because they don't know what they have. Mostly because they haven't built it. It's probably in some kind of ethics system or other uh, a patient management system, but it is exceedingly challenging to comply with what regulators are requiring. Um, also, because regulators don't really understand artificial intelligence, which I'm sure uh, we'll probably get to later. So I'm going to have lots of lots of slides here. Um, very, very, very few companies really know what they're doing. Very few companies have the right practices or what they believe are the right practices in place. 
I still firmly believe a lot of companies want to do the right thing. They just don't know what that is yet. Um, and we're all, we're all just trying to figure it out. That's part of my lab too. Um, now, I, I like to think about risks around AI systems as falling into a few different categories. This is by no means exhaustive, uh, but we have uh, application level risks on the left-hand side here, meaning risks that pertain to an individual model or system. And then the, the risks on the right-hand side are larger, more social community-based risks that emerge that maybe we can't solve on an individual model-by-model -model basis, but we need better, uh, better capabilities around. Uh, we talked about bias in the intro here. Uh, how many of you have a, an example of a bias system that you've heard of fairly recently? Do you want to share? The most famous one would be the gorillas and Google in a search. Yes. Yeah. So Google, for you, those of you who couldn't hear, that was Google image search tagging um, African American people as gorillas. Incidentally, they fixed that problem by literally just changing that label. Um, so this is, the misclassification in images is a big problem. Again, thinking about historical data or where that data comes from. Any other examples? Yeah. Um, I won't mention the company, but one of the large bank um, companies had a algorithm that was scanning CVs and matching jobs and didn't pick up for a good six or seven months that it was declining certain ethnic and uh, a lot of females that the, the you know the AI model basically said that they weren't going to be able to get based on their gender. So automatic resume screening, which was declining um, <laughs> female and minority uh, um, applicants, not based on characteristics of their resume, but based on other information. It's not only New, New York City has a law that they just been, it's going into effect on January 1st, which uh, requires all organizations using AI-based um, employee management tools to undergo a bias assessment. So an attempt to correct for that problem, not specifying what a bias audit means, not specifying what an AI system for employment decision making is, not specifying what an independent audit is. It's also um, so again, this is no. so bias is a huge problem. We uh, this is probably uh, one of the biggest problems that we're facing in the AI space right now. Uh, we just don't necessarily know how our systems will impact people un unintentionally. I don't think that most companies are creating systems with the intent of discrimination, but that is an effect that occurs and we need to think about how we look at that. Uh, but there are a whole host of other performance risks. A lot of models just aren't very good. Um, that's a really big problem. And if you don't have a good way to measure it, then you can't uh, detect that or correct that. Uh, there are security level risks for, for models. Basically, this boils down to the fact that um, people just like to circumvent any automated system, and so models are really no different. Uh, but there are a lot of creative ways in which that can happen. And this all is kind of summarized by we don't necessarily have good practices in place to oversee these things. Um, to define requirements of systems before we build them, to monitor them once we deploy them, to take them offline once we detect that they're no longer valid. Um, the risks on the right hand side, I think, to the to the broad extent, kind of apply for all, all types of tech. Uh, what do we want technology to do for us? What type of vision do we have for technology and its role for us in the future? And I would argue that AI is just a very small component of that kind of reckoning that we're going through as communities. Um, the, the way that this is coming into play for a lot of organizations today is through this, this thing called responsible AI, which is a, a, a term I love, but I think can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different organizations. At its core, I think responsible AI and responsible tech is just good technology practice. And that starts with having a good technology practice, which again, not everybody has. Um, so good data science in this, in this particular fashion for, for AI. Um, knowing what problem you're trying to solve, knowing what good looks like, defining requirements up front, working with stakeholders. There's a big uh, push for participatory machine learning right now, which is not a perfect solution. There are a lot of flaws with that, but engaging the people who you might potentially impact is one particular one potential solution for that, uh, which is one reason why I also really love some of the community engagement uh, um, activities that are underway to try and get uh, a whole host of different people involved in, in artificial intelligence development. Um, on top of that, you then have responsible practices, which can mean different things to different organizations. There isn't a common set of ethics or values that can be applied universally across systems, across organizations, across societies, and that's okay. But we need to know what our values mean and how we put those values into practice and do that consistently within an organization or within, within a community. Uh, and that's where these responsible practices come in through usually control mechanisms and then rolling that up to just defining what what type of future we want, what we will or will not do, not just what we can and can't do from a regular perspective. 
Um, like I said, I have a whole host of other slides, but I kind of want to give my panelists some time to talk. Um, and the, the last thing I will say is that the perspectives that we're doing with or that we're building around responsible AI are mirrored across all of the other technologies because AI is not an isolated thing. It's permeating a whole host of other tech. Uh, you might have heard of this thing called the metaverse that is in theory <laughs> coming our way. Uh, and that's AI combined with um, augmented reality, virtual reality, IoT, and a whole host of other things. So our problems will not disappear even if we can put on a headset. Uh, they just might get kind of worse and we have to think about how we can, how we can do that. If you're interested in what I call bad AI, I have a spreadsheet of almost 200 AI failures that I maintain for fun. Um, I'm happy to talk through lots of them. I have like a massive running list that I just think is really amazing and also important for us to remember so that we don't we don't um, recreate problems in the future. Okay. Happy to answer questions as well. Awesome. I go next. You want to say something? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Carlos Gutierrez. I'm an AI policy researcher at a place called the Future of Life Institute. The objective of my organization is to try to mitigate the long term risks of technology. Um, and I focus on AI. Um, I have a really short presentation and ask you a couple questions. But my objective with this presentation is hopefully I want you to remember just two terms out of this entire thing that I'm gonna tell you. And if you remember these two terms, I think this will serve you really well. Uh, and people would think you're really cool in governance circles when you're <laughs> in a cocktail or whatever. Um, so the two terms are hard and soft law. These are terms that we use a lot in uh, academic circles and in governance circles. I'm gonna to try to define them. If you have any questions, just sh shout them out. I don't care if you're sure. Um, so hard and soft law are ideas that can work with each other. They can work independently. Um, it doesn't matter how they're made. Uh, it depends on the usage and the context, the domain. It's, it's, there's no one solution to how to govern artificial intelligence methods or applications. Of it. And just to be a little bit more clear, a method of AI is a technique that is used to do something and to do something, that's the application. So how governments or nonprofits or governments decide or private sector firms decide to govern something, they use one of these two together or separately. So what is hard law? This is the one out of the two things I want you to remember. Hard law is anything that is directly enforced by government in order to force society to do something. So let's say you're in your vehicle and you go 68 on a 65 uh, mile per hour road, a cop stops you, they'll give you a ticket. They're trying to enforce a law and there is a consequence. They'll give you a ticket. If you don't behave, you'll go to jail. Um, but that is what hard law is. There are many hard laws regarding artificial intelligence in the world. In the United States, not that much at the federal level. At the state level, there's tons of things in Illinois, Texas, California. And at the city level, San Francisco has some really interesting facial recognition bans. But Essentially, what it is trying to do is government saying, don't do this or I'll do something to you. So that is what hard law is. Here in the picture, you'll see um, a really interesting piece of not legislation, but something that the Department of Defense has, which is Directive 3009. It's something describing how the DOD is going to do or not do autonomous weapon systems. That is hard law because they are enforcing it themselves. So does anybody have any questions about hard law? Any doubts? If anybody asks you two days from now, would you be able to describe it? Yeah? Perfect. Okay. Has anybody heard about soft law? I may. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know everything. <laughs> so soft law is a little bit more complicated. It's any program that creates substantive expectations that are not directly enforced by government. And you might be thinking, whoa, what does that even mean? It means anything that is just not directly enforced by government. So there's examples on AI, there's a bunch of examples. If you see a code of conduct, principles, everybody and their parents in terms of companies has AI principles or private sector standards. 
In fact, if we had the time, we could all get together and decide what are the L LMU, uh, MB, MBA, and MSBA, is that correct? I mean, MSBA, right. MSBA uh, AI principles, we could get together and we could create them. And that's one of the amazing things about software. Anybody can make them. It could be a race to the top. It could be a race to the bottom. They're super flexible. They have one key weakness. That if we create them, who's going to enforce them? Is it going to be me? You know, I'm just here for one day and then I'm going to go back to my job. Is it going to be the professor? Maybe they're not that interested. Students are like, oh, that was really cool for 45 minutes, but I have other things to do. So that's the main weakness of softball. How do we make softball effective? And how do we make it so that if we create it as a group, we actually implement it? So we did in my previous job, um, we dedicated a long time to studying software. And we identified every software program in the globe from 2019, December 2019 to the past. And unlike uh, Wine, this database doesn't get better with time. So if you want to use it, please do get in there. It's a really interesting database because what we did is we found 634 programs and then we classified them using 107 variables. And these 107 variables kind of label the text within the software. So if you're interested in knowing how organizations want to govern AI in terms of uh, culture, AI literacy, weapon systems, law enforcement, um, anything, because there's like 90, set, 90 something sub themes, go to this site and you can just control find and we have everything there. The idea is that if any organization wants to create a governance effort of sorts, they don't have to do all the work that we did in researching what is out there. Um, and what did we find? We found something weird, actually. That government is the main creator of software, which is something that we didn't expect because government has the best of both worlds. They can create legislation or they can do the software in order to nudge uh, entities or people to do something. So if you see here, that's what this triangle is saying. Out of the 634 programs, who created what? So at the very top, you see that government created a third of it. Then you see that a combination of the three parties created like 20% of it. And you can see the distribution there. Surprising, surprising distribution. We didn't expect it. But among the, oh, yeah. Would you consider something like the Me Too movement an example of software? It could be, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on what they're doing. If the Me Too movement creates a, um, a, a memo, an open letter, uh, principles of what uh, people should do when encountering into behavior or reacting to into behavior, that could be something for sure. Um, the movement itself, maybe, maybe not. It depends on how you construe it. But um, it's not something in our database because it might not be AI related. Although I guess you could put the AI angle to it. Um, you could, for sure. You could put an AI angle to it. I apologize. You gave us such a clear example of driving and hard law. Is there any example for driving soft law so that you can kind of think about Well, yes, there could be. For instance, uh, a lot of companies right now want to create autonomous vehicles. And, you know, Waymo, Uber tried for a little bit until that accident happened. And um, these technologies have standards that they have to follow because businesses want to follow best practices. So IEEE is a standard setting organization. ISO is another one. And they are groups of experts that come together and say, hey, we have to think about the best way to do a technology. Mm -hmm. And they create standards for autonomous vehicles. And that could be a lot of, a lot of things. It could be a uh, human person interaction when you have semi-autonomous vehicles. When you have a semi-autonomous vehicle, a human has to do something at a point where a car doesn't know what it has to do. So you could have standards as to what does the chime uh, look like? Is there a visual signal? So that's software. Um, can I answer your question? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so much. perfect, perfect. I'm gonna move uh, fast because I think I'm in the six minute mark. Um, so what you can see on the left-hand side of this slide is that only 32% of the soft ones that we identified, that list of 634 that is right here, only yeah. 32. Oh, is that the creator? No. <laughs> <laughs> only 32 percent mentioned some form of public implementation mechanism, and this crystallizes the weakness of soft law. We only saw that 32 percent of them said, "Hey, we're going to implement it in X or Y way." 
And I'm gonna end, oh no, this is not gonna, this is not gonna, sorry. Um, uh, you, the incentives, we, we analyzed this 32%, and we found that there's three incentives for successful software implementation. I'm gonna go really fast with them. So the first uh, way that software is effective and has been implemented is that government uses it as a warning or nudging system. It tells entities uh, throughout the jurisdiction, hey, I'm gonna create this software because if you don't follow it, I'm gonna create hard law and it's gonna be worse for you. So you better follow it. And then companies go like, okay, I'll follow, I'll follow. I won't do anything. Um, the second one is that businesses uh, or industry associations want to create soft law to avoid hard law. There's a really great example in the video game industry in the nineties with Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter where it's showing like blood and stuff like that. Um, Congress was gonna legislate on the first amendment ability to do so. So the video game industry said, no, we don't want government to intervene. And they created what we now know as the classification system and that still exists. Mm -hmm. And lastly, there's self-interest. There's several reasons why you have you create softball for yourself. It's either to protect consumer goodwill, uh, you implement standards because if somebody sues you and you mess up, then in a court of law, you can say, hey, but I use best practices and best standards. And courts in the United States use that as a mitigating factor when saying, hey, you screwed up. But because you did this, I'm not going to hit you as hard as I would. So companies have a self-interest motivation to protect themselves. And the very last thing, this you don't have to remember, but you great that you do, is something that at the Future Life Institute we're very interested in. In AI, there's a large discussion on AI alignment. And this is a huge discussion on how do we align AI, the goals of countries, individuals, entities, corporations, it's just too big of a conversation. We focus it on a sliver, a niche part of it, which is on the end user of fiduciary systems. Fiduciary systems are systems that, where there's a relationship, a legal relationship between a provider of services and a client. This is the case for lawyers, doctors, financial advisors, even real estate agents. Um, so what we want to do is think about, well, let's say in the near future, it's possible that an AI medical system replaces a doctor. And you know, doctors have a Hippocratic oath, they're licensed at the state level, and they have responsibilities that they have to comply with to a patient. But if we create an AI system that kind of replaces the doctor, they could be loyal to the hospital. And the hospital could have it minimize costs, maximize profit, and not think of patient outcomes. And we're really interested in, well, patients should know if the AI system is loyal to them or to who they're loyal. So we want transparency. If it's not loyal to a patient, who is it loyal to? And that's like a debate that we're really into. Um, I don't want to go further because I passed my time. Thank you so much and looking forward for questions. Thank you. Cool. Can you folks hear me fine? All right, good evening. Um, first of all, this was amazing, isn't it? Um, such a rich cognitive diversity of, of panelists. I'm really excited and honored to share, share my perspectives here. Uh, cognitive diversity is great. Um, how many of you are from engineering background in, in the audience? Yeah, how many of you are from business? Anyone from design? Anyone from a different discipline like arts or humanities? Super cool. Uh, why that's important. Um, I feel that cognitive diversity helps bring unique perspectives to the same problem areas. Like we're talking about AI and digital transformations today. It helps with divergent thinking, but then aligned expectations on what the implications are on business and more so on, on people. Uh, and there's a debate all going on around AI. Um, so for me, the context is important where I come from and what I'm going to share today. Um, Harini Jani, you can call me Jani, Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group. I'm part of the digital ventures business of BCG, uh, which is the management consulting arm. Um, we are builders at heart. We build businesses, products, systems, ultimately that end users like you can touch, feel, and see, uh, but even not knowing that there's AI behind it or some part of technology. So 
I have a multidisciplinary background, engineering, design, and business. Uh, but most of the lenses I think about are from a human-centric perspective. Like, what does it actually mean to innovate in a practitioner's view is what I'm sharing today um, from, uh, from AI and transformation. So the two topics, AI and digital transformations, I love first principles. And oftentimes we think about what are digital transformations? And let's talk about AI in digital transformations. And then we can talk about what the benefits are. So we all know about digital revolution. You know, obviously some of these companies you've heard of. How old do you think is Tesla? Any guesses without doing a CV or a Google search? Um, approximately 20 years old. So you think about, you know, the most, you know, highly public traded companies, the highest market cap 20 years ago, that didn't even exist, right? So we are talking about massive changes that come along the, the term digital. And there's no other quote that better explains this phenomena of digital disruption um, than the one here. I'll let you digest it for a second. You don't have to do anything wrong. Companies don't have to do anything wrong, but if there are companies that are riding this wave of AI and digital and, and really delivering solutions that humans love, that's it. That's all they need to keep you know, getting traction, not just about money, but also loyalty, right? And we all know about these applications and businesses and brands that, that we almost tap to and talk about you know, but no one would probably do that for some other company. So digital, you know, in a way is super relevant. And digital natives, companies that have been founded with the notion of leveraging digital enabler are driving what's called innovation velocity. It's how quickly can you learn about your end users and then create solutions and deploy them uh, and then leveraging AI across many different sectors. So that's not, for example, you know, does an absolutely amazing job. So a few years ago, if you were to go tell an automotive company that, hey, we're going to provide feature rollouts every 16 days, you probably would be laughed at. Like, you would probably skip that idea. It would be a posted idea lying somewhere because they used to work in three, six, or increments. You come up with this master plan of what feature sets would be, and you walk towards that in a waterfall way, wait for three years, boom, that feature's out in the market. But guess what? Things have changed. Customer behaviors have changed. So digital is not necessarily the output that you create using AI, it's actually the input. It's the human behaviors that are changing in the digital economy. It's the business models that are changing expectations because of the digital economy. It's the technologies that are unable to do things in a much simpler, better, faster, efficient, economical way than I ever thought before. And companies that think about leveraging digital um, are really struggling. And oftentimes when we ask, you know, incumbents that are not digital natives, like, hey, you know, these are all the things I'm doing. Like, yeah, but we not Tesla, we not Google. So the best answer we often get, the typical incumbent response is this. You've been doing this for the last five years. We have a massive digital transformation happening. Just wait for it. It's like, well, how long are we doing that? Well, three, five years. It's like, we're starting to value, well, we're working on it. We're trying to gather our data. We're working on our principles. We're trying to figure out the talent. We don't know what a tech stack is. And, and, the whole laundry list of why things are not working. Uh, and we realize there is a reason for it. It's like 70% of digital transformations actually don't work. Um, there are many reasons for it, but I'll highlight a few. So you can remember going back, you know, what are things that are relevant. Number one is this long cycle time, you know, and we expect, you know, things changing really rapidly. We expect delivery and we can actually see you know, when your door dash food is getting ordered and how long it is, but you actually can't figure out, you know, for emergency purposes, you know, where the ambulance could be. Uh, big ticket costs, like digital transformation is expensive from a corporation corporate perspective, and you don't know when you have paybacks. And you have this rigid waterfall cycle I was talking about, where you come up with a laundry list of all the things you want to do and then help tackle it. Um, but most of them would be theoretical in nature, because guess what? Human behavior changes pretty much every single day. Right? And by the time you try to build that solution to find the market, something else has come up. Two people in a garage create something super interesting and boom, they go and disrupt you know, cycles. And ultimately there are a few other things, which is it's imposed top down. Executives saying that we'll do this transformation, we'll put it in the hands of the people, they'll start using it and voila, we're gonna sure see all the revenue. That doesn't happen because it's again, it's humans, they have to adopt the product. Building up AI enabled product is one thing, Putting in the hands of people and bringing behavior change that's intended to be good is a whole different ballgame. Um, and so we believe it needs to be top down mandate, but also bottom up adoption. 
And lastly, transformations by definition um, are thought like there's a starting point and end point. Like project by definition has a start point and an end point. So all of a sudden you believe like after three years, the company's transformed, but that doesn't happen to you. Like, do you expect that by the time you enter, you know, university, and then after four years, boom, you transform and after your practitioner? Probably not. You keep learning every single day, and I still keep learning every single day. So it's a it's an evolution, not a transformation. And so, what do we need to do to get this right? To get products right, get transformations right, is to have a product mindset. Products, unlike projects, have features, right? How many of you have used WhatsApp? Do you remember the first feature they had? It's like text message, and they had like this double blue shell that said, yeah, you know, you got the message. Imagine if you didn't have that. You would be expecting like, well, you know, did they receive my message? You try to call them, try to call them again. You know, they'll wait anxiously for me to do a voicemail. But in a super simple feature set really changed the game. Now imagine if you were folks doing you know, messaging solicits. It's like, yeah, we have Yahoo Messenger, we have text messaging. Why do we create WhatsApp? But it was successful, right? You think about, you know, Citrix and GoToMeeting and uh, Google Hangouts. Well, if that was the case, we'd have never launched a Zoom. But it did because it did one thing really, really well to solve human behavior issues and then leverage technology as an enabler to help solu create solutions. So products, by definition, have feature sets. What we need is continuous understanding of user behavior. That's what it means data. We use machine learning analytics to understand what can be done about user behavior that will help drive adoption. You build small experiments, you put in the market, and you build test and learn. So the frequency of how quickly you learn and modify features, that's what's called innovation velocity. And the companies that do this really, really well are able to really help surpass. So again, digital transformations, are all about continuous value delivery and then use AI and digital as an enabler. So my three parting thoughts, if I wish I knew getting into the practice and role of digital transformation is you have to think about a portfolio of products and not programs and not projects. You know, that's what digital transformation is about. It's like, how do we create a portfolio of digital product that we can continuously keep it trading putting up new features, driving more value, the more adoption you get, the better it is. Mm -hmm. And you'll go look at some of the products you use every day and you realize how you are actually looking to enable it. Number two, you know, AI uh, is really more around augmented intelligence or assisted intelligence. In, in digital transformation world, the people think about number one, hey, it's gonna take my job away, right? Companies are scared for it. They think it's all about cost control. In fact, it's about enabling better human behaviors. It's about creating better revenue margins, creating new use cases we didn't think about. I work everything from using you know, AI for methane emissions or using satellite and AI to understand which are the 55,000 line miles of trees to be cut because not all trees grow at the same rate, right? And you cannot only have a certain number of people going and try to tackle wildfires and which trees need to be cut down. So you use a combination of AI, but again, as a means to enable human intelligence. Um, it is super important. We're not here to help replace it. And again, there's something we do great, and then something we do for greater good. And I believe that AI should really be used for the greater good for humans first and helping augment their intelligence uh, and help build that. And then lastly, when you think about then deploying AI at scale, it's really about 10% algorithms. It's 20% technology, but 70% is all about people and processes. We forget people are at the core on when we designing for, designing with AI. Um, and so that would be my learning, which I realized it's about how do we really think about you know, the people and co-create solutions with them. Uh, AI is really around helping bring the behavior change for the real world. And so that's what we need to share today. Thank you, Nicole. That was fantastic. Well, if any of you are wondering about an application that digital transformation has not tackled yet, I suggest you do parking because <laughs> I have been circled many, many times. And the really sad thing is I live in Marina Del Rey, and I'm going to probably just walk to um, But anyway, it's wonderful to be here. And so thankful to all of our panelists. And they were each hand chosen because they all have a very wide breadth 
in their career and in their combination of researchers and practitioners. So I think you got a little flavor of that. So I prepared a bunch of questions. I'm keeping time to make sure that we leave time for all of yours as well. So be thinking of them as we go along. So, uh, well, I walked in right in the middle when Alana um, introduced her bad AI list. So I think we need to hear <laughs> your top three bad AI fail. Oh, I can't pick three. Um, so uh, I started my spreadsheet just because this was 2017. Um, I, I kept seeing all of these different pretty public failures. And definitely there weren't that many. And so I just started keeping a little spreadsheet and this full summary about them. And I'm very type A and I'm also a consultant. So of course there are lots of problems in my spreadsheet. So it's, um, <laughs> you know, I have like sector and whether or not it's a government application or <laughs> what, you know, whether or not it pertains to facial recognition because there's a lot going on in facial recognition. So I started tracking a lot of that. Um, Carlos and I were just chatting. There's also something that's called the, the um, incidences database. It's a partnership on AI. So it's a published version of that. I just have that. I don't have like corporate approval to share my spreadsheet external. Um, so I think I think my favorite failure is it's a really weird I mean I have so many. I think the um the ones that never cease to amaze me are where I feel like I've seen the same entry multiple times and yet the same problem keeps coming up. And so that that's a lot of like AI used, especially in, in uh, public services. So when you see AI used in support of policing or sentencing, like I feel like we've had this conversation many, many different times. And yet that these systems just don't work super well because a lot of our policing and sentencing systems historically have not been um, perfect. And so, and have could potentially have been um, expressed as targeting specific groups. And so obviously those are going to be the same types of people that are, are surfaced through those systems. So. That's one that I think is obviously not my favorite, but it's it's uh, one that surprises me. The other one is something very similar around facial recognition or other types of image recognition, where again, these systems just have had many different failures over time. And there are really good use cases for these technologies, like amazing use cases. I use them almost every day at work, but we have to think very carefully about how we apply them because when you put them in a fully automated context, it just is um, kind, of, kind of surprising. So I think those are probably some of my Favorite rest. Yeah. Favorite uh, Great. And um, Carlos, I am curious to dig in on your discussion around AI line of base or to tease up at the end. And I know you just gave us, you were just trying to pepper in some thoughts there. Um, but when you brought up the example of the doctor, what I started thinking about was, you know, what's uniquely human about a doctor in, in that function is that a doctor is able to triage all these different um, considerations real time, right? Like they're thinking about, okay, um, I got to think about the patient. Um, I got to think about their pain and suffering, right? I got to think about the family. I got to think about the cost because ultimately this is a business and, you know, you, you can't, there, there, is, there is an upper limit to what um, treatments are available. And then you have to think about the like practicality of okay, what can I cope for insurance, right? So you know those are just a few of the different considerations that doctors are real time weighing. So curious how you think about how AI fulfills that ability to balance different um, considerations and where we are <laughs> on that path. Oh, that's a really good question. Let me give you a really bad answer. Um, so. Right now, AI can't do those things, and we're really, really in the infant stages of the possibilities of what medical AI can or can't do. For instance, right now, there's a group of individuals that are never really happy, which are red, um, radiologists, because essentially, a radiologist, what, it does, what, what a person with that um, job does is look at an image and try to discern, is there a tumor here or is there not a tumor here? And sometimes machines are really better at doing that uh, because they can do it thinking about all the different ways that they've seen a tumor before and maybe really small pixels that radiologists can and cannot see. And the problem there is, well, what do we do with those radiologists? And I don't have the answer to that. I mean, it's a really difficult question to say to individuals that are in medical school right now, hey, you know what? Your job is not going to be there anymore in the same way that people that were studying um, telegraphy at some point in the 20th century, their job was distinguished too. So I think the, um, the jobs of doctors are safe for now. Uh, 
or say for now, but we definitely know that doctors at the very least have a Hippocratic oath and that they have to advocate for good human or patient outcomes. That is not the case for insurance companies and hospitals. They do not have a no. They do not have to protect patient outcomes because in the United States, hospitals are businesses and other countries not necessarily. So there's different incentives and that's the, that's the importance of AI loyalty. Do we know if an AI system, when implemented, whose objectives is it following? And, and, and that is important to know as a patient. So next time, that are a hospital and if you ever see AI, it'd be good for you to ask, hey, uh, so what is this system doing and how, how who is it advocating for? And a, a great example of a bad thing that I, uh, I had at a conference recently was a consulting person told me that in Norway, um, Norwegian culture is very different. So a Norwegian supermarket told its employees to take a picture of themselves in their underwear to uh, determine the size of the uniform uh, that they needed to have for their for their employment. And people in Norway have a different culture and they, they took these pictures. And then when the consulting firm, an international consulting firm said, oh, how are you determining the size of uniforms for people? The supermarket said, oh, we have all these pictures of our naked employees. <laughs> so, <laughs> some of them were, were teenagers because in, obviously in supermarkets, there's, there's, um, there's people that are below 18, but it's a different culture. And in Norway, this is completely acceptable. But when the international consulting team came and saw this, they're like, okay, let's delete this data right away because of the privacy issues. In the United States, we don't foresee this happening because if Kroger or Whole Foods were to ask employees to do this, it wouldn't happen. But we have to take into consideration that cultures are very different. And trying to apply our cultural standards or stereotypes or norms to other countries in AI systems or in governance systems, it's very difficult to do. So that's why it's also very difficult to compare. I actually have two examples I want to add to. Well, so one is um, you also have to hope that patients will trust the system and you have to build that trust. Trust is not something that just like materializes over time. And there are a lot of different ways in which we still don't really understand how machine learning systems, AI systems make their decisions. We just see the outputs and we can evaluate that those outputs are in fact correct. Early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of discussion around using um, image recognition technologies to, uh, to look over all of the different lung scans and detect COVID-19 through lung scans. This was when our testing approaches were not really very good. Um, and there were some models that were produced that had really, really high accuracy rates. In digging into that, the distinction, the primary differentiator that they found in the samples was the fact that some of them were specifically noted on the bottom COVID-19, or they came from specific hospitals that indicated the, the designation specifically. So meaning the models learned not what we wanted it to. It wasn't actually differentiating COVID-19. It learned that there was a label on the image written in a corner, which is not what we wanted. Thankfully, they did explainability experiments to learn that. But, but the point is, is that sometimes systems look like they work well, but they actually don't. And if you build trust with people, it's very easy to break that trust if, if we learn that it's doing the wrong thing. Um, the other example I wanted to mention, also on my bed, I spread to you is um, we do have problems with sending photos and the privacy um, of that. There was a New York Times article a few months ago, um, actually probably just about a month ago, of a um, a dad that sent a photo of his child to his um, his primary care physician because there was a, a sensitive rash, I think you could say, on a small child. And because he sent that photo through a certain type of channel, it ended up triggering all of these privacy protections. And he's been effectively locked out of his entire digital life for months, um, even though like the FBI was called and he was found that he didn't do any wrongdoing. Um, all of these different AI systems that were in place to detect sensitive imagery and the transmission of child pornography um, triggered basically this guy, he can't even access any of his accounts, his mortgages, he's like completely locked out of his digital life. So these are systems that were built for good, right? I would say there's there are very few causes that are better than protecting our children. Um, but the, the, the fact that there aren't effective governance mechanisms over those and appropriate channels of recourse, and there's a structure in place where people are transmitting images digitally to their um, to their uh, physicians. It's it's uh, a lot of unintended consequences that I don't think people were expecting. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, the false positives in general is, is a huge issue. And, and then it's a question of 
who is being held accountable to police it, right? Yep. And so and we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, and um, you know, on the main thread of trust, um, Johnny, you um, started discussing some of these um, trade-offs and priorities that a lot of your clients have and how difficult it can be to create a sense of urgency around the need for digital transformation. And, um, you know, when you're preparing for this, you told me about some really interesting case studies um, that are really analogs um, with some industries that you've worked with, like bringing them along on the, on the climate discussion, for example. Yep. So I thought that would be a great example for you to illuminate a little bit. Like, how do you get these giant ships to course correct? Yeah, so speaking of ships and, and giant companies, we're going to talk about a shipping example. So um, <laughs> how many of you have gone and serviced your vehicle where a mechanic and the mechanic uses something in the engine and says you need some A1 maintenance or A2. Anyone done that recently? Okay. So yeah, in the US, like that's a very normal you know, procedure to do for, for maintenance stuff, right? And, and, and it's very simple, like for a $40,000 vehicle on average, a mechanic exactly knows how you've been driven, what the car has gone through and says, and it's an A1, A2 maintenance. We talk about a shipping container, you know, that's a $40 million vessel. And we've seen people do that on paper documents, like not even on Excel sheets. It's like, oh, is that 62 degrees or 64? And so what we found is that, you know, when you think about transformation for these infrastructure heavy companies, you know, it's not as easy to go and change things like, like a digital app because you have these massive assets. What are you going to do? You cannot just go and change them and make it a smartphone all of a sudden by installing a, a, you know, a Google Nest or a, an Amazon Ring. And so what we have really first understand is like, what are the big frictions that people have to do? Like what, uh, what's real, what's large, what are cute? Um, and a sim simple example would be uh, a VLCC, a very large food container emits a uh, thousand metric tons of bunker fuel a day, right? And we talk about you know, electrifying you know, cars on the road. A thousand metric fuels of emissions, how do you actually go and change that? And, and figuring out what are people doing in those situations when you realize like one small thing would actually go wrong. We have all about things that happen um, in, in the um, evergreen, so to say, on the transportation side, like had ripple effects all the way through across the entire supply chain in the world. But it's like 25, 26 people. Okay. So, so what we are trying to really understand is what are the use cases um, that could really go wrong and where's value that could be unlocked. So this is a good example like on a shipping front, but then we understand like, well, it's not just about monitoring emissions, actually controlling it. So we're building applications that actually control shipping emissions right there while the journey is actually going on versus what would happen in the past is, you know, all that ship comes in, goes in the port, they take all these documents, come with an Excel sheet, analytics come in after a month, and then say, hey, next time you should, you know, you know, steer your vehicle or ship this way. But guess what? It's a different ocean, it's a different water, water Maybe it's a different weather. So doing these things real time is kind of important. You're doing the same thing I was saying about vegetation management. You have 55,000 line miles of vegetation and you only have a certain amount of crew that's going to go and cut trees to reduce either storm outages or wildfires. Well, which trees to go and cut? Which trees to go on? Which ones to go get notifications on? Like, even if you apply human expertise, you're not able to go reach it every every way. That's why we're using satellite data to really figure out what's the growth of certain types of trees, and you use arborists and their knowledge to figure out how we can help do that. Okay, there's some examples of, of that stuff to help build use cases, but I'll give you a simpler one too in case I know these are not convincing, but it's on the analog front. So context is very important to help companies understand user behavior. It was nothing that you know was powerful for me than trying to design stickers for home organization products. Right now sounds like a very simple thing. I'm sure you may have used some of these folders and stickers for your university uh, documents and lectures. So we got data from, um, from the client saying, our analytics and business analytics team said that we need to create 16 different color stickers because that's what creates variety and users love that. So, okay, sounds come out right. But you know, we are humans and designers. We want to go in the field and really figure out what do people really want. So we go to Staples and we're doing some intercept, you know, with this lady who was probably going back and forth the aisle a few times. I thought that sounds interesting. Maybe that's a friction. She's not able to find something. So we with permission and asked her, what are you trying to do? 
It's like, well, I'm trying to find stickers for for school kids. It's like, well, what's your profession? She's like, I'm an elementary school teacher. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. But we saw you went down the home organization aisle, now you're in the, the staples, you know, office folder aisles. What are you trying to find? I'm really trying to find stickers um, for home uh, for school children's organization of homework. How difficult is it to find stickers? And I swear, this is what she said. I'm not changing a word. She said, I don't know what these designers were thinking because there are four colored stickers and there are five working days in a week. Oh. <laughs> and so, you know, you think back for a second, we can do number crunching and analytics and AI and all different models based on forecasting, but it's about the human behavior you often forget, right? That context is super important. So apply these use cases, not to stickers with entire organizations portfolio of products, there's a lot that will be uncovered. We just have that many few people who are trained in doing that. Um, so again, I think that's those are the human stories we bring to the executives uh, and help them understand that this is really about transformation, but for for human good and helping create solutions that they want to adopt. Else, you'll be wasting all that money. And, uh, poll for the audience: How many current or aspiring product managers here? Yeah, there's a few. Yeah. So uh, Johnny has launched 40 different products in his career. Like I said, he, he works across multiple industries and he holds multiple patents. So I'm curious um, if you could just give a little bit of perspective on the product management world in general and um, what advice you have for any aspiring product managers. Well, first of all, it's an amazing profession. Um, product managers, by the way, come from so many different walks of life. Um, through either different education degrees, different work experiences, but also life exposure. So anyone and everyone can actually innovate, think about you know, product centricity uh, and help being a product manager. Oftentimes when we go to corporations and say, we're looking for a product manager, we get project managers. Project managers can be product managers, but they aren't product managers. The difference again, as I was trying to explain, Project managers go with the mindset of, I have a start and an end date, everything needs to happen by this amount of time. You know, they go by, you know, the macro constraints and even hardly any micro freedoms to go change it um, because it's all driven by deadlines from business and trying to create outcomes for the company. Product managers try to create outcomes for customers or for users. Um, and the, that happens by, again, understanding what is the, the user need Right? And by the way, I'm giving a very broad term, depending on BDC. Um, a customer is not always the consumer or the user. So we think about baby products, the, the, the one-year-old is not going and buying the product, right? It's the mom or the dad or parents who gifted or friends who gifted for you know, baby shower stuff. So the, the customer has a different mindset, understanding a consumer has a, a bit different, but ultimately they're all people. So first of all, product managers to understand what's the ecosystem of people you're trying to design for, who's going to use the product, who's going to purchase the product, who's going to influence the purchase of the product. Sometimes it's about the governance, so like folks from IT, yeah, they have certain policies like, well, you cannot use WhatsApp, you know, you cannot use Zoom, you have to use Microsoft Teams, right? well, there you go. Um, you need to figure out what those governance are. Anyways, once you figure that out, it's really then about figuring what are the smallest things you can do, the biggest impact. So you build this on and you put it in the hands of people and you co-create with them. Uh, irrespective of the industry, it's all about co-creating with users and helping them understand, hey, I was part of it. Everyone loves to give advice. Well, then in fact, everyone loves to actually create the product you want. And then you figure out what the hierarchies are based on, A, the desirability, two, what's really feasible to be built, three, what is really viable that's gonna cost and you'll provide return. And then ultimately it's like the company that's building it, what's the strategic fit um, for their portfolio. So looking at those four variables and you create a roadmap of features and these features are either sequential so you have to build this then you build that or they could be staggered like hey i can build this by the time i finish building this i can do that or they are simultaneous like i'm going to build this and this at the same time so simultaneous sequential staggered those are feature sets and then you kind of go backwards with the north star simply put the product management really in the end is about continuous customer discovery to customer discovery, you can create continuous product feature rollouts, continuous product feature rollouts, into continuous value delivery, you get customers for life, you get more and see that well. But that's that's product management stuff in a nutshell.
Yeah, that's a great segue for going back to Alana because uh, you also started thinking about participatory mm -hmm. machine learning. And I was wondering if you could give any examples of how you involve end users in the process. So I think um, that's a fantastic question. And much like you're describing, I think there are multiple forms of users that you can think about. Same thing where you might build a system for someone to use, but they're not the person who's necessarily impacted. Um, so you, you should think about the stakeholders or users from a pretty complex lens. Um, one of the ways in which we're starting to see end users become a lot more engaged in the development of any type of machine learning system is also partly because of social media. We're all incredibly vocal about what we do and do not like. This is direct feedback that we can give to companies and they can then take that and implement that into their products. But some companies are starting to formalize that type of relationship. Um, or they might even be leveraging pretty like, pretty standard um, testing techniques like A-B testing. Like, hey, we're going to be showing you this. Tell us if you like it. Tell us if you don't like it. And then we'll incorporate that particular product there or capability. Um, the, specifically, the participatory space is trying to engage uh, typically um, marginalized communities in the development of systems that might potentially impact them or could even be designed for uh, good practices. Um, so there's a growing space of, you know, tech for good, AI for good, data for good, et cetera. Uh, a lot of those are predicated on the fact that you have to work with the communities that are impacted to be able to design that actually solves their problem. Um, when you don't do that, you might end up building a solution that looks really good on paper, but isn't particularly useful because it's actually solving. Um, and so that's a really inspiring space to see this type of usage. Um, Participate. I said that there's some issues with participatory machine learning. Um, it, it it all has to stem with like a balance of power. There's some really great papers on this right now that are, are circulating. Happy to send them. But uh, you basically have to assume or give people who you're trying to incorporate in the participatory design that, that you can give them an appropriate platform where they can meaningfully contribute and their voice will be meaningfully heard, not just a box that you check so that it says, talk to these people and I decided to ignore their opinion and do something else anyways. Um, and so that's, a, um, I think, a pretty interesting artifact of the word specifically. Can I add one yeah. point? It's like, this is such an important, interesting topic, you know, tying with what you said. Um, when we are thinking about reincorporation but specific design, one of the things you often do is like, yeah, let's go to friends and family. It's much easier, it's faster, we don't have to be in one area. But guess what? They all pretty much like you. And one of the big debates, and in fact, teams that we are trying to help change in any participatory co-creation is looking at, again, the diversity of participants and almost mandating it um, to make sure we don't have confirmation bias in just a screener. Right, like all the people we trying to design for and trying to make sure like there's a subset of it. Now, obviously, there'll always come strange like, hey, I only have this much time. I wish I can do all of that. But I think that's where we as practitioners can push back to say, well, no, we really have a design for it because there could be unintended consequences. And you might as well do that in the participatory design phase versus a product actually being rolled out, you investing a lot of time in it. So yeah, super interesting. Your, your point about diversity is really important because there have been a lot of features, especially like over the course of the pandemic that were, were released um, to try and facilitate things like teaching um, or uh, communication, but they aren't necessarily designed with completely diverse mindsets. And so a, a large number of accessibility efforts had to be started up pretty uh, late on into the pandemic because very clearly a lot of these systems that were built just didn't incorporate those individuals and having a more diverse team would have caught something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think really Yeah, and uh, similarly, coming back to um, an earlier topic on the um, like the accountability in general. So this is you know more your world, Carlos. And um, the, you know when we when you um, mapped out um, the soft law and who are creating them, and there was a Venn diagram of. Uh, you know, there's some that are created by governments and nonprofits and private sector. And so, you know, especially in that situation, like who is ultimately, who is the ultimate accountability, right? And who has the expertise to be able to like, besides, you know, you three <laughs> who are, you know, reading tomes of this all day and creating your own databases. You know, I, I always think about like, okay, well, who are the people on the front line enforcing these things like let's just start with the government right like so who has that level of expertise and where do we need to get to for that to be effective 
Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good yeah, question. Uh, and I'm not giving really good answers. Um, no, I, I, I think my answer there is that we have individuals that advocate for other individuals in all sectors. What they're missing is now that there are new problems that are coming up that haven't happened, that haven't happened before. That doesn't mean that that expertise yeah, is not there for advocacy and for being a line of defense. It just means that individuals have to think about new and different problems. So I think you're completely right. These are new problems that need individuals that have the expertise and that are dedicated to this. But that doesn't mean that we need new people. We just need to adjust the individuals that currently exist and have them have them be more aware of what is out there. So this is something that all of you can do in your future careers. You do not need to be a governance AI expert to mold the governance of applications of AI that are being developed by either the engineers that you're advising, the engineers that you're supervising. You could go into the corporation, the government, or the nonprofit that you might work in. Hopefully, as an MBA, you don't go work at a nonprofit. You go and really make the, the, the big bucks. But uh, but but when you go to to these places and you and you might ask, well. What are the hard and soft law things that we're thinking about? You might really open their eyes and be like, oh, what the hell are you talking about? And then that conversation can start because in the end, engineers are really good at doing a lot of things, uh, getting from point A to point B, solving a problem. But I'm a social science person. I care about other things like the externalities of those decisions or what are the implications of a product doing X, Y, and Z. In your perspective on this, if you start that conversation, you could have a role in being responsible for, for change, for governing in a way that, uh, that positively affects individuals and whatever products or services you guys design or deploy or, 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 yeah, or use. Open invitation. Open invitation. <laughs> and on that note, oh, good. Yeah, okay, I'll open up a question. Follow up question. So earlier you gave the example of a radiologist and yes. how his job's under. Well, I would say that. Until an insurance company underwrites an AI for malpractice insurance, the radiologist can be just fine because right now he's reserving all the liability. Um, have any of you seen the advancements in insurance companies willing to underwrite policies for AI? Yes. Right. That is, um, uh, there are several insurance companies that are actively debating how they would underwrite policies around specifically AI systems. And um, I would say, I don't think any of them have released the policies that I'm aware of, but I've talked to several insurance companies very far along in that. Um, it, it also requires them to think about how they would underwrite that and the risks associated with the system failing, um, which means that they start looking into testing practices and any type of certifications that systems might undergo, which is also where soft law comes in, because that's where a lot of the certifications come from, are from interdisciplinary standards efforts. So it's it's coming. My if if someone legally approves it, which is a uh, question over here. Yes, so we have an Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability it had a symposium a couple of years ago. So it had to be pre-COVID because it was in person. <laughs> but it talked about uh tri-sector solutions, particularly around climate change, that is, you know, government, businesses and NGO. Uh, I wonder and, and I'm thinking about you know the soft law versus hard law and a law that says you have to review your AI. So do you see some good examples of this tri-sector solutions uh, working on and how might we improve it? Yeah, no, there's plenty of examples. You know, standard setting organizations include all sectors, and these are efforts by uh, individuals that do not necessarily represent their organization, but you can have people from PwC and BCG and people like me from Future Life or IBM and other institutions thinking about a particular problem and how to provide the best solution for it. So that's that's one way. There's also multilateral institutions such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. That is a club of rich countries that try to think about really important problems for the future. And they involve individuals from from every sector. So there are there are institutions that do this. I can definitely see how individuals that want to partake in this conversation might find uh, various, various barriers to entry because it's not something very easy to get into. It is like a clubby space for, 
for IEEE or ISO, you have to be a member, you have to pay, you have to kind of show yourself and your that you have the requisite knowledge, but it's still open. But there are these areas where people can participate. Um, are they the best and most effective? Not necessarily in all contexts, but there are there are these four. I'm just thinking about the end users and the diversity that the way you describe them. Yeah, you're right. I, I don't think there is a place where end users can almost like a class action lawsuit get together to think about one issue at one time if it's not a lawsuit. I don't I don't think there is social media. Well, well social media, yeah. but that's just complaining, but, but not like that, medium term. That that is a space open we can do a lot a lot better. I think my other I guess push back on some of the standards efforts. I'm full disclosure, I'm part of several standards efforts, so I'm allowed to complain, is that a lot of them are overlapping. Mm -hmm. um, and they feel it feels a lot like there's going to be too much, maybe not useful guidance, rather than uh, something very specific that people can actually act on and comment on. And I think we'll we'll probably get over that hump in the next few years. There is, I mean, I maybe not addressing your question directly, but you talked about climate stuff. So. You know, those are going to require a coalition of, of different entities. So, for example, on sustainable aviation fuel, you need folks that are actually, you know, supplying the fuel and setting standards for that. There's, you know, stuff they require from the IATA, the International Transportation Authority. You would have someone like an Airbus that actually makes the engine, mm -hmm. then someone like, you know, Air France or those in Total who are helping with the aircraft. So, it's not going to be one company that's going to say, here's the standard for aviation fuel. It requires coalition. So that's already happening for actually many years. There are some papers around it. I think what needs to be then addressed as well, how do you actually contextualize it to different countries where fuel prices are very different, you know, the altitudes in which you drive are different. So they require representation. Uh, but anyways, cloud climate stuff so like that. OGCI is one more on oil and gas climate initiative. It's a coalition of big companies that are really trying to set up standards on methane emissions and what it needs to be done. So anyways, yeah, I I Think it's coming, it may not be relevant and maybe visible to all of us as end users, but uh, it does require multi party coalitions for all things climate. Uh, question here. Just wonder if you could say something about uh, changes in a company's policy values. Uh, and it, on the one hand, it could be something like mission drift, on the other hand, it could be iteration of pivoting. And I'll give you two examples uh, open AI. Of course, they were once a nonprofit and they became a for profit company. Mm -hmm. Another, we showed that up there at the DOD, where humans have to be in the loop for legal AI. But as we're facing adversity, uh, adversaries that could be shooting in an instant, that loop is getting a little bit broader. Well, there's exceptions to that. Um, there's exceptions in. Um... Offensive and, def and defensive weapons. Defensive weapons can be completely without human in the loop. And then cyber AI is excluded as well. Um, so if you were to ask, does the United States have autonomous weapon systems? There are individuals that say they do because in the defensive, there are those the weapons that could be thought of as autonomous. And there could be others that say, nope, there's no arsenal within the United States uh, cash uh, that is autonomous. So that's it's it's also a, a perspectives issue. Um, first of all, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Um, so thinking about data biases, um, what are some of the key tips you could give practitioners today? So say, for instance, you don't have ethical counsel set up, they, they might not have um, uh, some soft laws written. What are some of the, the questions practitioners should ask themselves to ensure that they're collecting uh, non-biased data if they're on, on that side of the business, or even from an algorithmic standpoint, um, how should teams just be thinking before releasing these applications? Oh, I think that's okay. I think yeah, please. That one first. I love this question. Uh, I think the first thing is to recognize that there's no such thing as unbiased data. That's uh, a term you hear floated around a lot. Just get that there's no such thing as have a, having a completely biased free system in general. But questions as to what teams can ask themselves as they're curating data and creating systems, I think are, are really important. One is uh, what purpose was this data collected for? Is this the same purpose that we're actually creating a system on? That's really important because a lot of times data is collected for one purpose or used for another and you miss a lot of the context. Heard 
contextualization over and over again, problem formulation, understanding what problem you're trying to solve is really, really critical. And what data you have to, solve to, to address that is, is part of that. So for what purpose was this data collected for? Um, who was it collected by? And which population was it collected against? A related question, but also very important. Um, this is because of long-standing biases around selection, selection bias or confirmation bias. I mean, there's a whole, a whole host of different types of social biases that can create in just from the data collection standpoint. Then you have, how is this data annotated? Because most systems are labeled or um, uh, uh, supervised learning systems, meaning that you say this is good, this is bad, and then the model learns to differentiate that. So again, how is that label created? Um, Labels are very imperfect. Uh, a lot of times we take labels completely for granted. We just assume that they're not true. Um, sometimes it's created by a grad student in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's because of a, a weird rule someone put into a system one year. Um, maybe it's because these are people who are actually hired and we're missing out all the people that we didn't actually hire. So these are, are all um, decisions that are actually made around how a label that we believe to be ground truth was generated. Um, I would also look at representation especially when you're talking about people, or even if you're talking about outcomes, do I have um, balance in my classes? So uh, do I have good representation across different demographic groups? If I'm looking at like fraud or something, um, what is my, what's the incidence of the rare event that I'm actually looking for? Um, these are important because they define the success criteria that we impose on top of that system and how we actually measure for success. So I, I think that the vast majority of work that goes into building a model is just understanding the data that you have at your disposal, how it was treated, what what types of decisions were made around that, how it was augmented, where it was um, synthetically generated, or where we had to remove uh, remove data points, really where we see trends, where we see patterns. That's that's the type of stuff that a model is going to learn, and so we need to understand that really well so that we can pick up where there could be potential biases present in that model. Um, the other thing I will say is to monitor the outputs of that system. And a lot of uh, increasingly systems are designed with not, not a, uh, an automated feedback loop, but an, an informal feedback loop where someone will retrain a system over time, just given the new experiences that we have. Uh, and thinking about how people make decisions on top of that output or how the outputs of a model will come back into that model going forward could um, create a feedback loop around bias as well or impose a new bias into the system. So there. A whole, host, a whole host of different ways in which bias can be done. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, um, this kind of follow up question on this. So it seems that there's one problem that keeps repeating this is human participant because we can assume that data is always biased, right? Yes. Yeah. So we need humans to participate. It seems that in each of these areas, we have lack of those humans. So mm -hmm. if we go with law and court system, we can imagine there's a jury system that mm -hmm. was invented at some point. Do you think, first of all, there are companies for doing this, or do you think there's a space for companies who can actually be consultant? You know, take the problem, the AI, they define how the AI will be used, and they, they actually find people, the diverse group of people who have the expertise and the incentive to make that fair for a particular purpose. Are there companies like that, or we should just go and follow them? <laughs> 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 don't know offhand any company that does that explicitly. There is a large precedent of using external, um, I would say auditors for lack of a better term, although I work for an auditing firm, so I, have to, I can't throw that term around very easily, uh, but external people testing a solution against specific requirements. Um, it would be interesting to see how we would have like a company that just like finds diverse people to test something, mm -hmm. um, but it's not inconceivable. I mean, I think that would probably be a really good question for you guys. Yeah, it's a great question. I I would be you know, lying if I say I'll like, know like these other companies go you know, go check them out. Yeah. Um, but I think part of the stuff that we try to do, and maybe just not addressing your question directly, is not looking at the AI and trying to adapt it. It's supposed to be looking at what are the use cases. It's like trying to have like having a hammer trying to find a nail and saying, well, I'm gonna you know adapt this hammer for X, Y, and Z. It's usually the other way around, at least how we think about it is like, what are the use cases to be solved? Who, what are we trying to solve for? And who are we trying to solve for? And once you figure out like the why and the who and the what, then we go into the how, right? And when we get it. So most of the time it's like a build by a partner. So if, if the thing like this are, you know, already exists and you'll, you build it, you know, or you go and buy and acquire the company because they have some things but they have to be adapted and you get the license to go do that. 
Um, and you feel like, oh, that's actually a good fit and you go partner. Like that's like broad strokes generalization. I'm sure once you get to that lens, then it's all about figuring, you know, who are the right people to be brought to the table. Again, like the cognitive diversity is very important. So even before we start thinking about problem sets, looking through a, a diverse team of people and say, like, what are we, how would you look at this from your lens? And we look at those criteria, write them down, go co-create, and then bring a 50% you know, new set of people. So the first 50% of the people say the same who are really enthusiastic because they can give feedback and they know the threat. And then you go 50% new, it's like, hey, looking at this for the first time, what are new things that we do? So either validates what are we thinking or it reframes our hypotheses and you keep doing the process. So again, I don't know the specific around what company, but I think that's the process we would you will follow. Does that address the question? Yes, you did remind me of one thing though, which is that there's a uh, a push for these types of bounty challenges that some companies have been doing, where they'll uh, they'll open source a part of their technology to the general public for them to test and poke at, and um, they find all all sorts of things. There is a, a pro and con to this. One, you obviously can't expose like very sensitive technology or highly you know protected IP. But it is a way to get some community engagement, and some companies are aligning on this. And there's a nonprofit that just formed to try and orchestrate some of these bias bounty challenges. Uh, this is also similar to what sometimes happens in the cybersecurity space, where companies will allow, um, you know, white hat hackers into their system so that they can think about how a system can be overturned or in, um, penetrated somehow. So there's like some of this stuff, but not not a lot of it all across the board. So a few times you mentioned that um, AI may lead to losing jobs. Uh, so thinking about the future of work, we are an academic institution and our students are here. What should our students be thinking about and preparing for to continue to stay relevant in the future of work? You know, when I went to bring water in the water fountain, I saw a typewriter out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was and off. Um, and I was thinking the same stuff. Like, I know this question perhaps comes up every single time, like, oh, bringing in AI, so we're going to lose jobs. Actually, that doesn't happen, right? Like, we, yeah, we lost typists, but then we've got people who are better in adopting technology, right? Um, as we would not be using our phones right now, right? And we'd be probably writing emails now, we get an invitation of maybe two weeks before by mail. So you come to LMU, but we use it. So it sounds almost too sometimes, you know, with the executives, it's very hypocritical. Like, or what people we try and put the poor product in their hands, like on Sunday nights, they're using you know iPhones and Samsung Galaxies, and then feel like, oh, Monday morning, if I go in my company and I'll be losing my job. Actually, it doesn't happen that because companies don't want to lose people. What they are really looking for is revenue margins and like finding new use cases. And that's part of the job that you also have to do from the business standpoint. Is like if you don't know what's possible, by default, you start thinking about cutting the cost. But if you can open possibilities and imagination about what are new use cases that people can help create and how you can take your workforce and make them better, because all humans want to go on that hero journey to like, you know, continuous learning and, you know, uplift themselves. So that's what we are trying to really push. Um, like, what can we do with the existing workforce to like upskill them, train them? Um, and it's, you know, being digital not is just about taking paper forms and making them a PDF or, start using Zoom and all of my workforce digital. Like, I think that's just a, a tool. It's more about bringing them along the journey. So I, I I strongly believe that, yeah, there are some cases where it would be making it redundant, but it's like taking that same workforce and bring them into new use cases for giving them that growth and some of these that do that really well. All the resources. I'll also add that one thing. Which is that there's a growing need within organizations for people to serve as digital translators or AI translators, uh, because there's a one small portion of the business that actually understands the technology and a huge portion of it that doesn't, um, and they speak very very different languages. So coming up in this time and age, you guys are actually very well positioned to serve in those roles if you can understand enough of how you make that translation between the different groups. And I think that's one of the um, one of the real strong suits of someone in a product space as well is that they can serve that role. Their, their primary responsibility is to be translating. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm coming back one thing that you asked the second part question, like what can we do? I think it's like just keep learning, right? And we need to have a growth mindset. It sounds cliche, everyone talks about it. We're doing the same today this evening as we've already you know, read somewhere something about AI and they've already got it. Um, so I think they just, you know, 
getting yourself the exposure with, with new people, learning the tools. Again, these tools you know, come and go. Like we started AutoCAD in 97. I'm sure some of them still exist, but new tools come along the way. Um, you all have heard some of the Figma, AutoCAD, Autodesk, you know, or Adobe, sorry. Um, yeah, like these tools come and disrupt it. They've always used the same way. Um, so just you know, embrace it. You know, understand that these tools are means to get to the end, and you know what what's the end job we're trying to get. You know, um, that's kind of what I learned um, as well. For example, one or two more. I think I've got one in back. Yeah. I'd like to jump on uh, our big all turning back. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to see is we're going to see like changing uh, the nature of responsibility. You know, we're going to see medical devices and these certifications and qualifications are going to make changes in the market. But eventually, there may be uh, the another tool that's being used by whoever's leading that particular class. A radiologist doesn't go in to see a patient, they're going to by an oncologist or a physiologist. They're going to bring in a radiologist in order to help confer the content. But I think the, the nature of that is going to move over to that intending to this. So from the uh, insurance disability point of view, I don't think we need to the AI system themselves to make sure it gets be covered in and everything and uh, and diversify you know what communication. I'm wondering what we see that fits in, but also how you know the dedicated generation is going to help alleviate some of the problems that give bias and data care to the data care system. I don't know if you had a question in there, but yeah. I think I think I think I think uh, you're right. If we, so we've gone through three industrial revolutions thus far. The AI would be the fourth one. And what we've seen and, and well, what the research shows is that with each one of those, we have less things that occupy our bandwidth. So you can imagine that with the first industrial revolution, which was agriculture, imagine all the things you had to do to get a pencil. Now imagine all the things you have to do today to write a message to someone that is gonna be received in Asia and they can respond immediately. Like these are things that you have less things to worry about today than somebody from the first industrial revolution had to, to get the same results. Now, I agree with you completely that a radiologist may not disappear uh, completely. What will happen is that their bandwidth of the, the decisions or things that they have to do will be completely different. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, we, these are things that we can't, we can't uh, foresee really well because if we could, we, we wouldn't be here. We'd be at a plane um, somewhere really Yeah, we don't have, yeah, we don't have money. But um, all these changes in society, the only thing that we know for certain is that they will happen and our space has to be occupied with something else. For instance, how many phone numbers do all of us know today? I think I only know my, my own. Uh, before, I remember knowing tons of them, uh, but I don't need to know that anymore. And hopefully, one, one can hope that that space that we used to use for remembering all those phone numbers is used for something more productive. I don't think that is always the case. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but all we can hope for is that we continue being more productive and we don't reach a stage of did anybody see the movie Idiocracy 20 years ago? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that we don't reach that that future. We I, I don't think we can end on the Idiocracy. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't really a question, it was just really more echoing what you've been talking about, about AI, not necessarily replacing jobs per se, but more enriching and enhancing um, our lives through various means. I mean, with generative design, with AutoCAD and all that stuff, now we're getting into the stages of generative design through AI. And, you know, taking a project that would take a team of engineers six to eight months can be done in a matter of 20, 30 minutes now. Um, I think that makes everybody's lives phenomenally better. It gets us from path A to path B much faster. So. Um, just echoing that point to your students, you know, being on that cutting edge and being able to create access to these technologies for people that don't have access to it, I think is. I, I just want to make a quick comment on that productivity, increasing productivity. I think there is also an incumbent, you know, mindset about, oh, we've got to work for such a long time, you know, or we've got to work five days a week for so many hours. So even if the productivity is increasing, I think there is this this mindset of oh 
we got to find more things. We got to do more things. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think is also something that needs to be looked at because, you know, so what are you going to do? You know, in 20 minutes, we are going to go from point A to point B that used to take, you know, six days, right? But does the management is going to allow you to do that 20 minutes and take leave for the other five days? You're going to find something, some of the junk thing for you to do, right? Yeah. You know, or, or, you know, or, or something else. And that creates, I think, a lot of these, you know, oh, we are wasting time or unintended consequences or things of that nature. So I think there is also in the management and organizational culture, there's a mindset that needs to change that as we are increasing the productivity and as we are moving with the technology, there's more laser time, more thinking time, more, I think, human development. Mm -hmm. so that should come into it. Yeah, I'll just echo that because like, you know, the productivity stuff is like a very industrial age you know, based notion because it was all based on a timesheet. Like you have to finish it from here to there. Innovation really, really doesn't work that way. Humans don't flourish that way. So just example, the gentleman talked about like, you know, using, you know, AutoCAD regenerative design. Like now, you know, you reduce the time in, in the actual usage of the tool, but it opens up stuff to think about creativity and imagine other things. Like we never thought about using that tool in a way uh, to consider climate impact. Mm -hmm. Right, but now we can like, hey, what would be the new materials we can, you know, do? So you have, you can now use the same designer or, or engineer or the group of people in spending less about telling the tool what you need versus the tool actually prompting you based on what you learn. Like, hey, if you're having this aircraft fly over this region, you know, what are the things that are very different than you know going over here? Or like, hey, this truck always goes over the Rockies, you know, and versus this one goes over flatlands and you know, hundred Fahrenheit. What are the changes on tire? So humans allow that aspect of enriching uh, is that we need to bring that exposure to executives say, hey, they can they can help imagine new things. And the companies that are innovative keep doing that. They unlock you know, new possibilities. So um, I, I'm a big believer that you know productivity is one measure, but it's really about helping take the human error to a, a different era of imagination and creativity. And that's what everyone loves to do. That's a note we can end on. Focus and attentive audience. Your questions were fantastic. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we really appreciate you giving us a flight for your life and taking all these fascinating topics that you study day in and day out and just going them down for us and being able to unpack it a little bit. And I think we planted some seeds of different directions we can all go. So um, thank you again. Yeah, thank you.